now we're going to talk a little bit more about those what and where pathways that we talked about in class. We're going to talk about the fact that when you damage parts of that ventral stream, that what pathway, you can occasionally develop something known as agnosia, which is when you are not able to recognize objects on the basis of sight. So we know that damage to the inferior temporal cortex affects recognition. Visual agnosia is defined as the inability to recognize objects by sight. Now, they can actually use other senses to help, such as touch or taste or things like that. But if, if sight alone is being used, it's not going to work very well. So we know that the inferior temporal cortex is critical to this. This is where object knowledge and memories are stored. Now, what visual stream is this? As I said, it is the ventral stream or the what pathway. Now, patients with agnosia have really helped us to better understand object recognition. And historically, we've had two different types. We've had what is called aperceptive agnosia, where the impairment is in perceptual processing. So aperceptive literally translates to without perception. On the other hand, we have people with what is known as associative agnosia. In this case, they can perceive the object, but they can't retrieve the object knowledge that they need to help identify the object. Now, one of the ways that researchers have historically tried to distinguish between the two is with what is known as figure copying. We know that patients with associative agnosia can usually copy images. They won't recognize what they've copied, but they can do it. Patients with aperceptive agnosia really can't. So here's what this looks like. Here's a case of somebody with aperceptive agnosia. Here's the case of somebody with associative agnosia. In this case, your copying is intact. But they will not be able to identify what they have drawn. Now, the problem is, is that if we just made it a simple figure copying issue, um, it would be simple. But figuring copy tests may not be subtle enough to capture some deficits. Not everybody who has agnosia has the exact same type of damage. <clears throat> so the tests aren't super subtle. Additionally, your textbook note, um, talks about some cases that um, people with aperceptive agnosia may have different types of deficits. So Riddick and colleagues back in 2008 reported two different types of patients with aperceptive agnosia. One had difficulty with grouping edges together, what is known as form agnosia, and they also reported a different patient, HJA, who had difficulty integrating multiple objects. So object recognition is much more subtle than we tend to think it is. Now we're gonna move on to probably one of the most important types of object recognition of all, face perception. Face recognition has typically been um, considered as being something much more unique and much more special and different from standard object recognition. And the reason for this is that the way that I've been talking about object recognition is that we obtain the local features and then we tend to process global ones. But face recognition is different. We don't identify somebody from their eyes and then build up to their nose and mouth and put that together and you have somebody's face. Rather, face recognition tends to involve holistic processing. So instead of starting with local features and working our way up, we look at the global information. We integrate information from the entire object and we put more focus on the relationships between the features rather than the types of features. And the other thing is that these features are generally processed in parallel. It helps us make processing faces much more rapid. Now, what evidence do we have that these are actually holistically processed? Well, we have a couple of historical pieces of research and information to help us out. So here's an example. Take a look at these two images, and you'll probably notice um, that they don't really seem to be too weird. They're not really weird. Like upside down, 
they don't look all that weird until I flip them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close out and I'm gonna flip this image. The focus on this one right here, I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this for you. Come on, don't be like that. All right, we're gonna rotate this. Here was the, um, so now the image that you saw over here that didn't look that weird, it's now over here and you can actually notice that the lip, that the mouth and the eyes have been inverted. So I'm gonna go ahead and close on that. So one of the things you'll see is that it's a lot easier to notice these kind of differences when a face is right side up, the way that we normally see it. When you flip it and you put it upside down, it's a lot harder to see that difference. It's a lot harder for you to notice that difference. So this is what is referred to as the Thatcher effect or the face inversion effect. Generally, it's harder for us to notice differences or changes in facial features when faces are inverted and turned upside down. And this generally does not happen with other objects. We don't do this with houses. We don't do this with cars. We only do this with faces. Other pieces of evidence that we have include something known as the part hole effect. This is the idea that it's much easier for us to identify object or facial features like eyes or a nose or a mouth when it's presented in a whole face rather than when it's presented in isolation. Again, this is not something that happens with things like cars or with things like houses. And then we also have what is referred to as the composite face illusion. So what you're looking at are a couple of different faces here. And you'll notice that every single one of these faces looks different. So if you look at the whole face, you'll notice that there are some huge differences. Everybody's face looks different. Now what's interesting is that I have basically taken the same top face, this is the same person's top of their face, but I've put them with a different bottom. So here, compare this to this, you'll very easily see that just by changing the bottom half of these faces, I make all of the faces look different. So just by changing some of the features in a composite face, we'll notice that the face looks different. So occasionally, we've been told that faces are really special. So we have things like the face inversion effect, we have things like the part whole effect and the composite face illusion. In addition to this, we have evidence from people who have prosopagnosia, people who have a very special type of object recognition where the only things that they cannot recognize from sight are faces, even for people that they know really well, even for their own faces. And so there's an area known as the fusiform gyrus that has been implicated in prosopagnosia. Now there are some things to keep in mind here. First of all, there are going to be individual differences any time that we are looking at brain damage. Brain damage is typically not very clean and is going to differ from person to person. Second of all, it is possible that um, surgical intervention where you have brain damage due to surgery might be different from brain damage that happens because of a concussion or because of encephalitis. So these could result from different factors. Additionally, people have argued that there might be a special face processing area in the brain. And so that is the lateral fusiform gyrus. We sometimes cutely refer to this as the fusiform face area. We do often tend to find that it's damaged in those with prosopagnosia and that activation here is two times larger for faces than it is for other types of objects that we might recognize. But is the FFA all it's cracked up to be? It is important for processing faces, but remember that no one area acts in isolation. The occipital lobe and the temporal lobe are also involved in face recognition. Other researchers have found that the fusiform gyrus is also selective for animal faces as well as human ones. And as a devil's advocate rule, we are We've been exposed to faces, human faces in particular, our whole life. 
So maybe we find that faces are special, not because they actually are special in any sort of way, but because we're experts at recognizing faces. So are we just face viewing experts? Ideally, it has been said that if you become an expert in a particular category, you're gonna be more likely to engage in holistic processing, whether we're talking about bird watching, um, car parts, or things like that. So researchers have suggested that the fusiform gyrus will also be highly activated for these categories. And if we damage the fusiform gyrus, not only will you see prosopagnosia, but you will also see damage to areas of high expertise. So this is where the greebles come in. So maybe we can train people to identify greebles. Um, with training, participants are faster at identifying greebles, but even with expertise, you don't see an inversion effect with greebles and you don't see a part pull effect. So is the fusiform gyrus for expertise? Well, some people say yes. The fusiform gyrus tends to be activated when greebles are recognized, especially if they're well-trained. And Gauthier looked at um, things like faces, familiar objects, birds for bird watchers, cars for people who love cars, and it turns out that expertise does influence activation. But not everybody finds this. Other people have found that fusiform gyrus activation is no greater than for untrained objects. So it may not be an expertise area. It might actually be a face area. Now, what about people who are, have prosopagnosia and they're also experts? Um, results don't actually fit with this assumption. So you would think that damage to the fusiform gyrus would not only hurt your face recognition ability, but also areas of your expertise. Sergeant Signoret in 1992 reported a case of RM who was not only um, a car expert, but also had prosopagnosia. And they found that his face recognition was poor, but he was still better than controls at identifying cars. So maybe the fusiform gyrus is not an area of expertise. Maybe faces really are special. So what this means for us is expertise theory is not reliably supported. There is something different about faces. But if I have to give a quick devil's advocate view, research has occasionally shown that to be a true expert in something, you have to apply 10 years or 10,000 hours of what is called deliberate practice. And that practice has to get increasingly more difficult and more challenging. Maybe what we think of as expertise is not truly expertise because these people don't have as much training with those objects as they do with faces. And that's just a possibility. So that's all I have. Um, we will talk about how we use object knowledge to interact with objects when I get back from Florida. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend and I can't wait to see you on Wednesday. Take care.